Things like that. All right. How's everybody doing out there? Hopefully well. Uh, I'll put your comment up here. <clears throat> hit the like button. Um, yeah. If everybody could just hit the like button on the video a while, that'd be great. Um, I'm not, I'm not the monetize or anything. I don't make any money from it. But the problem is if people don't hit the like button and don't subscribe, then the YouTube just kind of buries the videos that I put out. So I'll have to probably start saying hit the like button, please. You know, so if you could do that, that that's good. Um, thank you for making that uh, suggestion. I do appreciate that. Um, so we'll just give it a few minutes here. Uh, how's everybody doing out there? So hopefully well. Good. Good to hear that. Hopefully everybody's staying warm. We've had sub zero temperatures here for a couple of days. It's uh, cold. <laughs> um, hasn't been real bad during the day, but um, it's supposed to actually get pretty warm tomorrow. Uh, yeah. All right. I guess we'll get started here on this video. We're going to talk today about buying land for off for off grid living. How do you buy land and everything else? Um, so, well, three o'clock a.m. here. Well, there's Cynthia. That's uh, pretty early in the morning. Okay, buying land. I have some experience with this. I'm actually going to be showing our former property today. It's actually right here on the map that I have up. Be zooming into that. I'm going to go over a number of things, some points, and then I'm going to actually get into showing you how to find land. Okay, a good way to do that. Point number one on buying land that you want to avoid is no right of ways or legal easements. Um, I will be showing that on the map here. Um, in other words, you can find land sometimes that just is so cheap. Oh, wow, how could it be so inexpensive? But the problem is you have to go through somebody's land to get to it. You have a right of way, a legal easement that goes back through. And the problems with that are um, even best case scenario, you really meet somebody that's a neighbor's great, a good person to deal with. They can still park their truck on your lane on the, the right of way. They just had to pull it there temporarily and then they get a phone call and then they have to go someplace and they think, oh, he's not coming today. And you come when they're gone and their truck's right there and you can't get around it. And that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, you can have some jerk like what I used to deal with where he has control of the right of way going back in, but he's supposed to keep the right of way open. And yet he's putting big, huge piles of dirt on the right of way. And I'll get around to fixing the, the road going back in eventually when I have time. And, and I'm saying, well, you know, I need to get back to my property. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. I'll try to get to it, buddy. You know, and the guy's just drunk all the time. That's what I dealt with for a couple of years. At uh, our, um, when we were up in Bridgewater, living in Bridgewater, and our property was in Littleton, Maine. Um, legal easements are never good. I talked to a lawyer actually about it, and when I was going through the whole nightmare we went through, and he said, you know, in the future, he said, my advice to you, he said, there's no such thing as a good, you know, legal easement or right of way. Every single one of them has problems and he's i can't tell you how many cases i've dealt with where people had problems with the right of way issue so do not be tempted by the cheap price of a property that has a right of way going back to it there's a reason it's cheap number two 
if you can find land that has recently been logged, especially in an area like here in northern Maine, that land will be cheaper. And I know that there's, I've seen it over in uh, Norway. I saw the one time a guy was showing some land was actually pretty cheap, but it had been logged. And you understand what happens when they log, uh, especially with the modern high yield logging, it's called. They go in with big machinery and they, they don't even have guys with chainsaws anymore and skitters. Now it's just these big machines. They grab the tree and they cut the thing off, the, the tree off, and they lay it down. And what's happening is they compact the soil, especially when the, on the skid roads and everything else where they, they drive with the skitters down through and they got these huge skitters. I mean, just gigantic things. And I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the equipment up here. I have pictures I could show, but not going to for sake of time, but just huge big skitters. Um, that they pull the logs out and they run over the soil and they compact it. And I've, again, I've known of, of properties where it's 20 or 30 years since it was logged. And yet where the heavy machinery was, it still hasn't regrown trees in that area. Why? Well, because they compact the soil. I mean, how is soil made in a forest? A soil is made by having the trees grow up or the plants grow up, they die, they come down, they rot, they compost, makes the soil a little bit more rich, and then it just keeps doing that. And then the trees grow, and then their leaves drop, and then that builds up the soil. And it takes many hundreds of years to build that up, but it's not really smashed down and compacted. And when you smash it down and compact it with logging, um, it's not going to grow very well. It's going to take a long time for, you know, earthworms and things to get in there and kind of aerate that soil and it's it's bad and then you have the water runs off and it, it makes a lot of trouble and I, again remember that modern the the modern era of logging with chainsaws and skitters and everything else really isn't that old it's not even 100 years old yet um you go back 100 years ago a lot of logging crews were still using crosscut saws and axes and certainly independent loggers as well um, you know, 1922, you wouldn't have had much in terms of mechanization. It would have been, you know, horse logging, probably some steam power, you know, without going into, into a huge big discussion on the history of logging, which I could do um, because it's been an area of study and really fascinating. We actually have a lumberman's museum right up the road that way, uh, up north west of our office here. And very interesting story about how that they would, you know, use old steam powered things and whatever else to log. Um, but if you get land that's been logged, to go back to the original point, um, it's cheaper. And there was a rate here in northern Maine, I, the realtor that we've dealt with for many years, he told me about it. And it's kind of changed now, I guess, because of all the inflation in the housing market. The super bubble that has been created because of all the people being displaced by the pandemic so i don't know what it would be now but um if you would buy land that was li literally just recently logged in maine i mean that year you could get it in some areas for two to three hundred dollars right around two hundred dollars actually and um our first property that we bought in maine in the town of littleton it was $280, I think, an acre. So, um, and it had been logged hard. I will show some of the proof of that here. But logged land is cheaper, something to consider. You go in there, you can do things to, you know, uh, I mean, you're going to be dealing with a lot of trees where the skitters are, you know, the ones that they left, the trees that they left standing, skitters will go through and they'll, they'll just rip the bark right off of those standing trees with the trees that they've logged or that they're pulling out, that they're skidding out. And so you have a lot of damage and things to trees and, you know, but you can help the forest to regrow. It's going to take many years to make that happen. But that's, again, why it's cheaper. Um, I mentioned this yesterday, no power at the road. If there's no power available, accessible to the property, that also will lower the price and bring the price down quite a bit. Um, uh, another point to make, if you can buy it without mortgage, without getting a mortgage it's going to be a lot better it means you know you'll be a lot more free to do things and build things on that land um, we've bought our different properties without mortgages and um, it definitely makes you a lot freer it's a good thing uh, another possibility 
in terms of an off-grid homestead would be a, a cabin on rented land. Okay, um, there was actually a place, a camp up sort of to the northwest of us um, where our property's at, and it's way out in the middle of nowhere. It's an old um, uh, hunting camp. You know, I think it was a total of 2,000 something square feet um, and uh, really nice, but I mean, talk about remote. It was way back there. Uh, not quite over into the Allagash Wilderness area, but it's sort of on the border of that. Um, and a really amazing place and pretty cheap price. But the problem is getting back to there. You'd be doing a lot of road maintenance, getting back in there. And uh, the issue with um, rented land is, yeah, you have no neighbors for many miles. I mean, you can be back in the middle of nowhere, but then you are there and whoever owns that, that land that owns that lease uh, probably it would be Irving here in, in uh, J.D. Irving uh, company, big, huge logging company. They own almost everything in the state. They probably own the, the lease to it. Well, your beautiful, pristine wilderness camp can all of a sudden become a totally wrecked logging wasteland. You know, then there might be some stipulations where they can't go right up and against the camp or something, whatever. But it's still you know, could really change. And of course they could say, Hey, you know, we have to get rid of the lease here and whatever. I mean, there's, it's tricky when you rent land. I know in Pennsylvania that there were actually camps that uh, would be rented up in the um, Pennsylvania Grand Canyon down. Actually, I always want to say up because I was from Lancaster County and Tiger County was up. So I grew up saying up, excuse me, but, uh, in the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon area of northern Pennsylvania, there were areas where people had cabins built and it, they had to rent it from the state. And the state eventually came in and said, you know, some of these cabins and things have to be torn down because it's wilderness land and whatever else. And they actually made the cabins that remain. They told them you have to paint your cabin a certain way. I think it was a white, white with green trim, like forest green trim. So. You, you get into some weird stuff if it's not your land, um, you know, and then you have issues of cutting firewood and you have to get a permit for that. And it's tricky. Um, works out sometimes, but with the way this government's going, I don't think I'd want to be uh, renting anything from the state. Um, another thing that you want to make sure of is that there's no fracking in the area, gas wells and things like that. Um, I have experience in northwestern Pennsylvania where they were doing the gas wells back in the 1960s and there was the place where we were staying the first place that my wife and I had after we got married it was this little cabin back in the woods and uh, had electricity and running water and the whole deal but there were pipes you'd be take a walk out through the woods and there'd be pipes coming up out of the ground and going over this way and there's an old well over here and an old motor thing here and you know all the stuff from that they just abandoned the gas well type of thing. They were doing oil and gas and our water would come out clear. And then you'd let it sit, you'd put it in a pot and you let it sit for 10 minutes or so and it would turn dark yellow. Uh, absolutely toxic. You could not wash laundry, any kind of white laundry um, there. It would just turn it yellow. I mean, taking a shower, it smelled really bad of sulfur and all because the water you know, the uh, aquifer had been completely poisoned over the years. And it, well, it's still, you know, it won't kill you right away. Yeah, but it was bad. So they start getting, if you don't understand what fracking is, if there's shale in an area, um, they drill a hole down in and then they put high pressure water down in and they crack it and then they can get the methane gas comes out and they'll pump that out of the gas well and everything else. Well, you say it doesn't sound too bad, but the problem is, the chemicals and the, that they put in with the water to do the fracking, the fracturing, um, those chemicals can seep into the aquifer, and they oftentimes do. And the gas can seep into the aquifer. It's it's terrible. Okay. Um, so if you know of a place and they say, well, there's gas wells in the area and there's some there's been some fracking, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. Um, we were looking at some land in West Virginia before we moved to Maine. Uh, many years ago because i have family down there my older sister and her husband are down there 
Um, and there were some neat areas that looked really pretty, but the problem was that there were gas wells in the area. And we just said, after what we came from and went through up in northwestern Pennsylvania, there's no way. We don't want anything to do with gas wells. And we looked specifically for places. We were looking at upstate New York, and there was some shale up in that region and things. And we were thinking, okay, there's no gas wells right now, but that could change. And so we moved to Maine because there's not a whole lot of shale up here in this part of the state. And then they, you know, try to do the Wolfton thing and mining up just right, you know, north of our, where our land is. And so that was a little bit frustrating. It, it was shot down for right now, but hopefully, you know, they're saying, oh, we're going to still, you know, continue to try and we'll, we'll be back. You know, we're not, it's not over yet. So mining is something that you really need to look into. Is there much mining in that area another thing to think about when buying land would be um is it a rainy or dry climate that's going to say a lot about the type of place that you have um how are things going to work out for you um, you need to study the climate you know what what are are you going to be able to get water there you know and what are you going to be facing when you have a homestead there there's something else to think about Another point I'd like to make is a thing of, you say, well, I don't have the money right now. I just, there's no way um, that I can do this. Well, there's a possibility of multiple people coming together to buy land. And you'd have to work out a really good, um, you know, deal with that where you can say, okay, we need to write out on paper who gets what and whatever else. But there are families that come together and they might buy 40 acres of land or something like that and each family gets 20 acres two families each gets 20 acres or you might get four people coming together and each one gets 10 acres of land um so that's a thing that you might consider um but the one thing i need to warn about and that is the thing of christian communes or communes in general um i don't know very many that have ever worked out okay um they're very dangerous they're very bad because what happens usually is you get people there and everybody's kind of thinking you know this is my land i have a right to be here and you know heads start to get butted and then there's somebody that gets you inevitably are going to get somebody that's lazy they're not going to be pulling their weight they're not going to be working hard and then there's other attitudes that flare up and then they start to get people on this side it's kind of like going to a church building you know it gets clicky and then there's problems and they start fighting. If you're going to join together and have a bunch of families living, buying a property, then you need to make sure that you have enough land that you're not even seeing each other. And you can, hey, can you come over and help me? I need to put up the roof on my place or, or whatever else. Um, you know, sure, absolutely. But a, a commune where everybody that's communal living and those never work out okay and there's some historical examples where it went really wrong really bad so i would avoid the thing of if you're going to have multiple families coming together fine but make sure there's enough land that you don't see each other um but i would avoid communes communal living bad idea another thing that you need to think about especially if you go up north is what about winter road maintenance how far back? I mean, you go way back in and whatever else, how are you going to keep that thing plowed out or snow blown out or whatever else? Um, is there a way that you can park your vehicle out at the end of the lane and snowmobile back in or snowshoe back in or whatever else? Uh, we have done that. Um, and it works, but with catalytic converter thieves out there, it's kind of not always the best idea to park your vehicle out at the end of the lane unless it's a really low crime area but again this area has been very low crime but all of a sudden now we're having problems in this area because people are getting desperate for money so there's a lot of things to weigh out um another one would be a creek or river crossing well if there's a body of water that your lane goes back through and crosses you say well that'd be pretty it'd be nice uh well until the beavers find the culverts that uh are underneath your lane and decide that uh, they'd be awfully easy to, to dam up with sticks and mud and everything else 
Um, yeah, which I dealt with as well. So, uh, <laughs> so now we're going to get into some of the things here. I'm going to show you where we actually had our property. This is this map here is the town of uh, where do we have it here? Littleton. Right there, you can see the the town of Littleton. Right there. Okay, Littleton, Maine. If you just want to zoom out here, I'll I'll zoom back just so you can see. Okay, it's kind of up in here. The upper part, the crown of Maine is this up here. The Aroostook County kind of comes over here and then down like this. So but we'll zoom back in here to Littleton. Southern Aroostook Agricultural Museum is a pretty neat place. Um, but you can always tell our property because it looked like a, we'd always laugh and say it looked like a big stick of gum right there. Okay. And there's our property. You can see how it was logged. All these little lines right here. This is the main, the main lane going back through the, the skid road that they would bring their log trucks back in. I'll show you here. I'll zoom in. You can see some of the tops that were left over from the logging operation where they would go in there. And uh, this is back towards the back part of the property. This spot right in here, I actually built some things back here. This was exactly one mile away from the road. The road being down here. West Ridge Road or Foster Road kind of came down here. So, um, but yeah, this is, that was our land right there that we had where we were building uh, for a few years before we finally had to sell it. And I will tell you the story here. Um, right down here, let me zoom in, 270 Foster Road. And I'm not, I don't care about privacy stuff because we sold this. We're not, um, you know, we have no connection to this any at all here. Um, but this is our neighbor here. This was the neighbor that was a drunkard. Okay, this guy, he lived inside his little barn here thing. And he was a drunken Catholic, and he does he's dead now. He's in hell. I tried to witness to him. I preached the gospel to him, and he flat out rejected it, told me, he said, I will never believe what you believe. Very wicked man. But this... Our right of way was the middle of this lane going back through here, and it was 50 feet wide is our right of way that he was not allowed to build on. Okay, so here to there was fine. But then he decides he's going to put this single wide trailer here on right on the right of way and this concrete pad. So you can see how much he's blocking this whole thing off. And so what happened is this was not here when we first bought our land. So we were able to get back in here, but usually he had, he had junk vehicles everywhere. This was sort of a little, um, like a, I forget, you call it a Quonset hut or like a shelter logic type of deal. That thing there, he had a bunch of junk in that, but, you know, just stuff all over the place. And so we were always dealing with the thing of when we come back, are we going to be able to get that even back in our lane? And a lot of times the answer was no. And so, again, oh, our land was was really cheap. Yeah, we paid just over 200 and I think it was about $280 an acre for it. So, yeah, it was always oh, super cheap. But it was a right of way. That's what I'm saying. Please avoid this whole situation. So you go back in here. And there comes the lane back in through, back through the woods. Very pretty. Oh, wow, look how beautiful wilderness-y like thing looking. There was an old trailer that he pulled back into there. And I think his bulldozer in his backhoe right here and here. Again, he put this big pile of dirt right there um, to fix the road going back in. And this is Big Brook. You can see it says Big Brook right there. Um, and this is where I did a lot of my sermons, right in here. And this, there were three culverts here, one originally, and then he put in two more. This was his job, by the way, to keep this whole thing open for me. It was part of the contract and everything, part of the deed and, and everything else. It was his job to keep this open, and he never did. It was just, it was a nightmare. 
And I'd say, you know, and, he, and then he said, you know, hey, I'll do all this work for you and whatever else. And I didn't understand the contract at the time. And so I paid this stupid slob, I think $4,000 at one point in time to do a lot of the work for me, not understanding it was actually his responsibility to keep it open. And, you know, and, oh, well, you know, oh, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I wasn't aware of this. Or so it was leading to a court situation where I would have taken him to court and probably had to sue him. I didn't want to, but I was, it was leading to that. And then he died before I could do anything. And they put the place up for auction and we didn't have the money to buy it. So it was kind of a, oh, great. What do we do? Uh, but just to show you here, this perspective of when I would do my sermons there, let me show you this one right there is the lane right here. Excuse me. Right here is the lane going back through. You can see it's not, you know, there's, these weeds right here because it was not right there. It's where it's washed out. And um, the lane wasn't even open. I wasn't even able to go back through with, with anything but a four wheeler or a dirt bike. That's the only way I could go back. Most times we just walked back. We would park about where I'm at there and then we'd walk back to our property, I'll show back how far it was. But right there is that side part of Big Brook right in here, like this. So you can see that right there. And then this one, you can see where Big Brook goes up through like that. Again, that's the backdrop for a lot of my old videos, if, if people didn't understand that, right there. So, oops, this way. So right there, Big Brook going up in. This is where I would stand and do my studies, right in here. And my vehicle would be parked right there, like that. So, um excuse me, yeah, over there, so you go back through here, up along the lane this way, up back through this way, and then right here, you'd hit this corner, and um, I did a video right here too, um, let me show you that one quick, uh, Um, yeah, right there. Okay, this right here, this backdrop is right there, is where that backdrop is. Inside, look at uh, my weird videos over the years, but. You turn this corner, and then this was a really steep hill that came up, and um, this right here is the start of our property. So that entire distance from here, or I should say from here back to there, was one half mile, exactly one half mile. And then from that point right there back to this point right here was another half mile back in there going by the way of the lane. So very secluded very nice back in there a lot of mosquitoes <laughs> that was a pretty terrible thing with all the mosquito stuff back in there but um here's another area of logging damage there was actually an apple tree right about here um this is an old uh what was left of a cabin you can kind of see right in this area there's that's the old uh like that would be the chimney and it had fallen down. I actually built a place over top of this. I was going to build our cabin. Um, it was 24 foot by 24 foot. I was going to build it right there. And we sold it before I could get that done. I had the insulated floor down, everything else. Um, couldn't get it done before winter. So I put roof metal over top of everything to you know, keep the snow off of it and everything else. But I was going to, in the spring, I was going to build, put the walls up and everything else. That would have been our house. There was actually right down in the woods, um, right in, I think it was about, I'm trying to think of where that was, probably right down in this area somewhere, there was a spring, a really nice spring, very powerful spring, never went dry, even in the driest summers, really good water, very clean. Um, so it was really a nice spot. But this right here was an old, or maybe it was that. That might have been something I had parked back there at the time, or that might even be the new owner's deal. But this was an old outhouse back here. 
where the mouse is pointing there. This building right back in here kind of has a weird thing. There. It's, that's just clear roof material in between the green metal roof material. So you can see the rafters. That's what those whole looking things are. Um, but that was a gas shed that I had built. And then I had parked a, a fifth wheel trailer right here that we would stay in. I guess they got rid of that. Or this might be a picture before that happened. And then you go the whole way back into here. And um, back in here, I had put up a wall tent in this area. And then I put up a storage building right in here is what I had. Um, that's where we were keeping our stuff. So, uh, and like I said, um, problem number one, of course, was the right of way. This neighbor up in here was awful to deal with. Um, problem number two, the log land, oh, it was cheap. Yeah, but there was so much damage to the property that it was, it would have taken me years to fix that. Okay. Um, and then of course, no power, no electricity, and there was no way to get it back because they couldn't cross over this brook thing really without a lot of expense. And then of course the, the river crossing right there, this usually was okay. Like I said, it had three culverts, which the beavers would dam up quite frequently. And then this right here uh, would always wash out. This area right there would always wash out. And sometimes it would be from here to here would be completely just water going through there. And you'd have to drive through the water to get back in there. And, and um, it was something else. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'll just show you an example of how to find land. Okay, just do a Zillow search. I'm used to Zillow. I know Zillow has its issues, but you can use Redfin or some of the other real estate things out there. But just to show you what land goes for in this area up here, here you have 85 acres of land for 42,500. Um, I'll just click on that one just as kind of a see now that one there. Um, if you can see that right there you can see let me kind of okay that's you can't zoom into that thing at all but right there it has road access so look for that and you say all right well there doesn't look like there's any driveway going back into it but at least there's no right of way but you'd have to check into it and say well you know is there a right of way there or whatever else um Okay, sitting on Route 1 provides road frontage and direct access. Wood recently harvested within five years. So that would mean the price is lower. Um, property and tree growth tax plan to help or to keep taxes low. Greenleaf, Greenleaf Brook runs across front of property looking for affordable land. Well, okay, another thing that you need to look into is tree growth tax plan. Okay, check what different states will have different things on that. And let me explain that. Because here in northern Maine, if you put a property or anywhere in Maine, you put your property into tree growth, uh, it lowers your taxes way down. Taxes are very cheap. But you can only log certain areas and build on certain areas of the property. Um, I knew of a property that was 166 acres of land, and yet only one acre was not in tree growth. So you had one acre that you could build a house or a cabin or whatever else. Everything else was in tree growth. And if you want to take more land out of tree growth, you'd have to contact the authorities and, and say, okay, I need another acre for farming or you know another five acres. And then you pay a penalty for that. And basically, if it's in tree growth, you have to have, um, you know, the forester will come out and he'll tell you uh, how to manage your woodlot or whatever. And then you occasionally you have to have the property logged. So it's Maine's way of saying, hey, you know, we want to ensure that we have um, plenty of land to log out there. Um, so our first property was not in tree growth and our current property is not in tree growth. Thankfully, we made sure of that because it's really kind of a pain, but 27.66 acres for 44,000. These prices are way too high. Um, it should be down below, especially for this one, it should be below 500 an acre, um, is what I would say in the old world before pandemic nuttiness happened. But I'll show you here the idea of buying a cabin, um, you know, with some land. Uh, it's 20 acres of land 
and this place here, um, close to the Mattawamkeag River, you know, different things, a little doctored photo there with the uh, sunset. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can look down through the thing and, and um, you know, just a simple basic cabin. This is a, I was talking about the other thing about an older place on the property. Um, not, not anything real fancy or whatever, just to show pictures through it. But you know, if you don't have a lot of money, you can you can get started with something like that. That stove is not really a good one. Those old cast iron stoves like that, they don't really heat all that well. They they leak a lot of air, and so they you know pull a lot of air in and give very little heat out. Say it that way. Um, steel stoves are better, in my opinion. But this one actually has electricity. So. little garden shed tool shed thing there but there's the property so just to show people what's out there I mean you could buy a place like that 20 acres of land you could build something else or you could you know have a little farm type of thing on it um, raise some animals and whatever but even that you know 44 9 years ago that would have been you know before the whole pandemic thing that would have been a lot cheaper for that place but uh, there's a place in town town of Holton for 29,900 you know it's northern Maine is a very cheap area 50,000 for this place here and um, to show you that real quickly you think oh wow it looks really quaint and cute and everything well you think so you know it looks wow look at that boy it's really neat the drone shot there yeah but uh, um, the inside, I already looked at this place, is pretty rough. Okay, a lot of people will just walk away from a property and leave just a bunch of junk like that. You know, insulation falling down. It's like an older guy probably had it, crutches in the walker there, and some water damage up in here. You're getting into that kind of a thing. Washer and dryer. Pretty rough. Exposed wires, exposed pipes. <laughs> um, but you know, hey, this you want to get a place like this and then just use the land or try to fix the thing up or whatever, that's another possibility. Um, as people run out of money and whatever else, it might be the only possibility that you'll have if you don't have a whole lot of money and you want to stay out of debt. So um, just to show you, I mean, that's some of the stuff you'll run into. Yeah, especially here in northern Maine. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people up here and they say, yeah, you know, a lot of, I talked to a plumber the one time and he said people will just abandon their house and walk away and just leave trash in it. I've seen it myself many times. So, um, but just to kind of compare, you know, somebody asked in the live stream yesterday, uh, what would be the best places to go off grid? And I said, you know, well, any place that's really far away from a city. But a lot of people think of Montana, you know, they'll think, someplace like that out in the west um but you compare you know properties what things cost again you might be spending more money but there's a lot more land out there too you know there you have 327,500 for 10.78 acres 125,000 for five acres 99,000 for 20.37 acres but then you get down into here there's 1.9 for 5.5 acres you know and that's why again a lot of people they hear that we have land and they say oh wow you must be really wealthy no our land is cheap here but you move to some places it's very expensive um 64,500 for 20.1 acres that's getting close to what we pay here in northern maine um going down through here there's 1.7 million but then you're getting almost 3,500 acres of land 15 million for almost you know well over 9,000 acres of land that's a lot of land um i have seen a few properties up here in northern maine with their thousands of acres but uh yeah um usually not that much but again just look at different states upper peninsula of michigan's a good area for off-grid type of things 
but please understand i'm not trying to draw people if you're from the city and you think oh, i'll just go out there it's oh man it's just so cheap it is cheap but it's a very hard life it's an extremely hard life it's a very good life and you that's why i said in my first part of this seminar off-grid living is 90 percent up here and 10 percent here okay that doesn't mean that only 10 percent of your day is work and the rest is you know thinking sitting around intellectually thinking of the mysteries of the universe or something no what i'm saying is you're working a lot but you have to have the right mindset for it you have to say hey i'm enjoying this this is fun and i want to go out and spend the day today splitting firewood or going out and working on the road that goes back to my land or repairing my roof or you know taking care of building a chicken coop or something and you have to think of it as fun and entertainment if you're just seeing it as work you're not going to last very long um because it's a very hard life so uh, hopefully that answers uh some people's questions um but there you have the like i said just to show it one more time so there you go everybody that's always wondered where was i at there and whatever else that's the lane that went back to our property it was not a green screen like people tried to say some people people that are a little weird in the head so but uh, uh i guess that should do it for this i've covered everything in in this and and i'll say this again if you would I don't mind hitting the like button for the video again i'm realizing this i'm a little slow sometimes and i think i don't care if people like it or not you know but if you you know, if people don't like the video then the video doesn't go anywhere and it just gets buried in youtube censorville so please like the video and if you aren't subscribed please consider subscribing again the channel's not monetized that's not why i'm doing that i'm just saying please help the videos to get out there and share them with people that are interested in the off-grid thing so having said that does anybody have any questions question and answer time here on the off-grid Seminar number three, buying land. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Do I know any books that are about cabin building for dummies? Um, well, there's a... <laughs> Uh, there's a bunch of them that um, Shelter Shacks and Shanties is kind of an old uh, classic one from the early 1900s, I think. That's a good one. Um, there's a there's a bunch of older, you know, you just go out and you can get ones. I don't know if there's a Four Dummies one per se in that series. I don't know about, you know, that, but there's, there's a lot of good ones in print out there. Um, what is legal grounds for bio, biogas when, why, when buying land? I've never checked into that. Um, I really don't know. What are your thoughts on tiny homes? Well, I live in one currently. Um, it's a good thing. Um, maybe not for everybody. Uh, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes when you're living in an eight foot wide, you know, building or something that's on wheels. Um, I'll be talking about that uh, tomorrow, actually, with the thing of recycled housing. Um, more about our tiny home um, but they're a really good way like I, I said yesterday you here in northern maine and well in the state of maine you can actually build a tiny home and have it considered totally legal by the state and whatever else they actually have a provision for tiny homes and it's a really good way to pay down debt and to live very cheap um, you can build one yourself there's ways that you can use recycled housing which i'll be covering tomorrow um, it's a good thing in my opinion and you can live there for a few years and then build up your money and then go out and buy something that you'd rather have or you know if it's a if it's a tiny home on wheels you can even you know take it someplace else stay at somebody's property until you have your money saved up and then buy land and then take your tiny home to the land and then buy other land and you can keep moving your tiny home so there's a lot of people that do that there's some good, really good um, channels here on YouTube that show you I think uh, um, I can't think of some of the names of living big in a tiny house um, there's a couple of them and they show a lot of different types of tiny homes 
So something to consider there. With owning land, can one put up an electrical fence for protection? You can, but, you know, I guess you could, yeah. Question, in regards to buying land together with family, what if these uh, family members are lost? And you have to be really careful. If you get along with them, okay, but be real careful with that. And again, make sure that you buy enough land that they would be able to have their own land where you're not seeing them. They do their thing, you do your thing. Um, question, is mineral rights that important? Yes, because if, you know, there's some uh, company in the area and they have mineral mineral rights on your property, or there's another company and they have timber rights on your property, um, you can get into real a real mess with that. They can come in and start mining and things in your area or whatever else and really mess up the aquifer so that your water system's messed up. Be a bad thing. <clears throat> What about buying a small chunk of land off someone you know that owns a lot of land, like farmers we know or something, make payments to them instead of bank? Yeah, absolutely. I've known of people again that have that they'll actually go to a farmer and they'll say, I'd like to buy some land. And kind of like, you know, do you have some land to sell or whatever? And they'll actually buy land and they will help out on the farm. I actually knew of a situation where they actually worked at the farm for the land that they bought. So yeah, very good idea. Question, you ever check out using RV fridge connected to biogas, no electricity needed, EMP proof? No, I haven't. Like I said, I don't really know a whole lot about the biogas thing. It's something that I've heard of, but I just have never checked into it. Um, how do you know where to go to forage for berries? Do you just go hiking and run into them? Yes. You have to you know, understand, obviously, if you want to go into a swamp like this area, this area right in here, whatever, the real swampy area, you're not going to find many red raspberries. They don't really grow in swampy areas. Um, but down in this area, in here, it was kind of dark and, and uh, a little bit damp down and through there, and there were cloudberries, and that's the area that they like. You want you to understand there are certain areas that berries grow in, you can go find them. Um, so, yeah. After purchasing land, are you to pay taxes on it as well as the water? Um, well, if you purchase land, you're going to pay property tax, but there's no uh, there's no kind of cost for water or anything like that. There's no town water if you're buying remote land, <clears throat> if that's what you mean. I, I don't know if I got that exactly right. If you can put, if people can put question before your question, the word question all in capital letters, I can see it. A little bit better if you don't mind that would be helpful um, what states would you say are best to buy property for off-grid living um, well if you like warmer climates you can go down south Tennessee Alabama Arkansas you know things like that um, then you can go up into the kind of the Missouri and you know areas and things you know, and then you can head more to the, towards the north, the more northern states where it's going to get colder and whatever. But you just, you know, the farther you can get away from big cities, the better. So, you know, your New York City, your Boston's, your Miami, um, Los Angeles, Chicago, the big cities in America just kind of look on the map and say, okay, how far away can I get from those places? Um, that's going to be the best, you know, if you want to have remote land. Um, question, can you bury your loved uh, on the property once they are deceased? Uh, never really checked into it. Um, there's one of those things probably, probably would be best just to say, okay, go ahead and do it. Don't ask people's permission for it. Um, if you get caught, you'd have some explaining to do, but I don't know. Um, question, how do you dispose of dirty, soapy water? Well, um, the same way that old people, old timers used to do it. Um, they would actually just sink would go out, and a pipe would run out, and it just goes right out onto the ground. Um, it's not the, it would be considered gray water. It's not the same as black water, which would be actual waste coming from a toilet, a flush toilet. Um, and we actually do that at our property. And it's funny because where our, our tiny house is located, it's on an old kind of a stone 
thing it goes back in like gravel there and no plants grow on it because it was where they did a lot of logging backing the big trucks in and whatever else and our soapy water we use good you know biodegradable stuff we don't use chemical you know bad stuff and where our soapy water comes out at is the only place where plants grow on that entire stone pad there and they grow really prol prolifically you know really nice and tall and everything else so um the dirty soapy water is not a problem for plants as long as you're using the right kind of soap. Um, so, but good question so far. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? take that one down question how do you deal with problems with food in a colder climate um, well it's actually pretty nice that's one of the things we like about our colder climate because we have free um, freezing and even refrigeration for six months out of the year uh, it's pretty nice, actually. Um, if you have a room that's that's uh, insulated but not heated, you can use it as a refrigerator. Just monitor the temperature, and you can open the door to where your heat's at, so more heat can get in there. Um, there's actually a guy on YouTube that made a refrigerator um, with doors and everything. That the back part of the refrigerator refrigerator has little vents that he can open up to the outside to let outside air come in. And so he can regulate his, you know, food temperatures and things in there. Um, but you can, you know, you can actually have free, you know, we just take, you can put things in coolers and keep it in a building outside and it stays frozen pretty much all winter long. And if you have a day where it gets up above freezing temperatures, it's going to still stay frozen if you have enough frozen material in that cooler because they'll keep each other frozen and you know, you have a, a day or two of warmer temperatures, but then it goes right back down to freezing again. Usually there's no problem with it. So living off grid in a northern climate is really good. Um, how deep is land packed hard by logging skids? Uh, it depends. I mean, we literally have parts on our new property where it's a good probably 18 inches deep. where You can see where the tire treads sunk down. Um, with the logger uh, or the the, yeah, logger, the big skitter, um, they can do a lot of damage. And, you know, we have nice roads going back through, but they're all rutted out in different areas, and it just does not grow back in. And so we're busy right now trying to fill in those ruts. So that's one of the reasons why it's very cheap, because they basically ruin the land, and you have to really work hard to get it back to what it should be. Um Question, what about networking concerning mine land in case brethren in need uh, to flee their country? Brethren, that's, thank you for bringing that up because that's something that I think is going to be a very big issue in the future. Um, and we prayed about that and eventually, you know, we might try to set up something, but it's there's going to have to be rules and a lot of things there. Uh, we will have to help each other out in the future. I believe that. So, um, and I think that the north, the northern parts of whatever country are going to be very sparsely populated as times progress into the future because the cost of fuel is going up and all the environmentalist green agenda and everything. They're going to be pushing people towards the smart cities because that's the system of the Antichrist. Firmly believe in that. And so the northern areas are going to be a good place to live, but you have to learn how to live there. And especially if there's no winter road maintenance or something, you know, along those lines, it's going to be tough for people. But our ancestors did it if you're northern European. So um, answer another one here. Question I had to go, so it may have been answered. What telltale signs are there to know if there is accessible well water on the property you're interested in? No, I didn't cover that. Actually, it's a good one. Um, I will be talking about that in more detail in an upcoming seminar 
I'm not sure which one it is. Um, okay, number six, finding water. Um, well water on a property can be tricky, especially if you move into a mountainous area because the higher up you go in elevation, the harder it is to get water there and drilling can go way down in. And I mean, I've heard of people with wells that are hundreds of feet deep and um, but then I know of, you know, mountainous areas too, where there's a spring up actually climbing up the mountain and the water comes out of the mountains. So um, that's a big thing to look for. You know, uh, you know, you could have, you know, different types of, of springs can come up actually through the ground, especially in the, during the, the spring time of the year. Sometimes they'll dry up in the summer. It's another thing to you know, get figured out. Um, there could be a local spring in your area. Um, that's what we have uh, that is active for most of the year. It's only two or three months in the summer that it dries up. But I'll be covering that in part six. So, uh, question, can you have multiple houses on one property? Depending on the property, depending on the area, absolutely. Um, yeah. You can do that. Question. My ancestors are Southern European, but I can't handle the cold. Is there any food that would benefit from colder climates in the U.S.? Um, yeah. I mean, there, there's you know, the growing season. That's actually another part. That's another seminar. Um, let's see which one it is. Uh, number eight. Seminar number eight, warm warm versus cold climate. There are some uh, places down uh, south here in America and whatever countries everybody's in, there are warmer areas many times, unless you live like in Canada or something, then you know, you're know you kind of stuck with the cold north. But um, here in America, you can move to the south. There are areas where you can go to that are, you know, going to grow a lot more food so there's definite benefits to that so but uh and of course you know i'm seeing you know one of you there is saying about diana you know yeah i mean you can go other countries too and things you know south america and whatnot so um there's a lot of a lot of places that you can go. It's a big decision to make where you want to live and things. So, but we're coming up towards about um, towards about an hour. So I'll answer one more question here. I see, and then that'll be it. Um, question: Do you still use your Berkey for filtering water? If so, do you add minerals to it? Um, we do not use the Berkey at the present time because uh, we don't need it we have a, a really good spring in the area and um, very good water um, and so we really don't need it um, so but we would use it if we have to you know, do you know rain water or whatever else um, so okay one more and then I'm done <laughs> Best way to find a woman to marry who'd be happy living in an off-grid lifestyle. Another one I'll be covering in a future study, but um, be talking about that. Uh, best way to find one is just simply to pray. First and foremost, if you're saved, you pray like crazy and say, Lord, I'd really like to have a wife that could, you know, live this kind of a life. You find a girl that's into the outdoors, camping, you know, things like that, a girl from the, you know, the, that likes to, you know, she's from the country, she's a farm girl, whatever. But it's it's just mostly a matter of prayer. So that's going to be it for this video. And um, thank you to everybody out there for watching, for your comments, for your questions. And like I said, just please share these videos to help the help them to get known and whatever else. It's, um, and um, thank you to everybody out there for your donations too. I'd like to say that. If you, you want to donate to the ministry to help this project out because it's a lot of work, um, GoFundMe. We have a GoFundMe page you can 
um, find that, or you can go to my website, kingjamesvideoministries.com, and we have PayPal there. So that's all I'm saying about that. Um, but uh, just enjoying this so far. Come on, get down. Dog's trying to jump up here. And uh, we will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we will be talking about recycled housing in the fourth part of the seminar. So we will see everybody then.